In November of 1789, Benjamin Franklin wrote a letter to his friend, French scientist Jean-Baptiste Leroy, in which he mused on the newly ratified U.S. Constitution. He wrote Leroy that while this Constitution did have a promise of permanency, the only two things one could be certain of in this life were death and taxes, a statement which the newly founded U.S. government would prove to be all too true in the short years following. I'm King Trout, and you're watching That Time That Thing Happened. Today's thing, the Whiskey Rebellion. I'm an American, a red-blooded American, and that means I love three things more than anything else in this world. Guns, booze, and hating paying taxes. This story has all three. Our story begins very shortly after that letter from Benjamin Franklin. Both he and Leroy were dead within five months of the writing of that letter, so death was certain, indeed. Uh, taxes, unfortunately, live on. The year was 1790. The fledgling nation of the United States was struggling. It had just found itself on the winning side, thankfully, of a very bloody and violent revolution. Unfortunately, we owed a lot of people some money, mostly the French. Jean-Baptiste Leroy. At the time, there were two primary political parties in the U.S., and they did not like each other. Thankfully, we've moved beyond that since then. <laughs> They were the Federalists, who were in favor of a strong federal government, bringing all the states together into some sort of cohesive union. And the Democratic Republicans, who were more in favor of a decentralized federal government. They wanted states to kind of do their own thing, and then the federal government would just work to hold the states together in more of a confederacy. Now, thankfully, they were able to settle their differences before anything bad happened. Now, Itty Bitty Baby USA had just come out of a pretty violent revolution, fought primarily over the desire to not have to pay some shit taxes. And the way it was set up at the time, each individual state owed their own separate debts related to the war. In the Compromise of 1790, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans came to an agreement. The federal government would assume all the debts collected by these separate states, and the capital of the new nation would be in a southern state. And would you look at that? They got so close to almost doing what they said they would. It is touching a southern state. So, great job, Federalists. Let's give them a round of applause. In the negotiations leading up to this compromise, each party was represented by one of our nation's founding fathers. On the side of the Democratic Republicans was third U.S. president and ponytail haver Thomas Jefferson. And on the side of the Federalists was famous Hispanic playwright Alexander Hamilton. Some say Hamilton had a motive. Yes, that's right. Hmm, but what? Well, on the surface, it may appear as though assuming all of these individual states' debts collectively together as a nation would be a good thing. It led to something bad. Fast forward a few months, now it's 1791, and instead of each individual state owing its own debts, the federal government owes everybody's debts. Yay! What are we gonna do about it? Well, Alexander Hamilton has an idea. Hmm. And so, Alexander Hamilton went before Congress and went, Um, guys? You know how we, like, owe all that money? What if, as the federal government, we just taxed people? And everyone went, You mean that shit that we just got done fighting that violent war over? And he went, Yeah. And they voted yes. Interesting, though, isn't it, that he would propose that the U.S. government take over each of these states' individual debts and then turn around a few months later and, in line with his party's ideals, Propose a concept wherein the government gains powers it never had before. Hmm. And so the 1791 Whiskey Excise Tax was born. The tax itself wasn't on whiskey specifically, it was on all alcohol, whether produced in the US or imported, but whiskey was growing very popular at the time, so the nickname came about. You could choose to pay a flat rate based on the number of stills that you had, or by gallon. So, if you were a powdered wig wearing, putting a feather in your cap and calling it macaroni, East Coast rich city boy, you just pay the flat fee for the still. No big deal. But, meanwhile, on the frontier... Oh, not that frontier. Uh, we're talking 1791. The frontier at that time was Western Pennsylvania, the Appalachians. We didn't make it very far yet. But life was rough, and these people were poor. And I don't mean scrounging around through your cup holder looking for change because you're hungry for a McChicken pour. I mean, what is money? Why do you even, what is this paper? I don't want that, I'm trying to live. That kind of poor. 
Most were subsistence farmers, just making it day by day. It was a struggle out there, and when you weren't fighting starvation or the wildlife, you were making sure that you weren't getting f into any peaceful interactions with the non-violent indigenous peoples of the region. Bad times. Life was rough, and they wanted a drink, and I don't blame them. One of the crops that was easy to grow in the region, though, was corn. They had an excess of corn. What we do in the modern United States is turn it into liquid gold, high fructose corn syrup, baby, but Captain Crunch Oops All Berries didn't exist at the time, so instead they turned it into liquid brown. Whiskey, not diarrhea, although gastrointestinal parasites were a pretty big issue at the time, so probably diarrhea too, but I meant whiskey. There were tons of benefits to having whiskey instead of corn. One, it gets you f***ing hammered. Two, it's significantly lighter than corn. And three, it's shelf stable. People were using this shit as currency. And while these large East Coast whiskey distilleries could just pay the flat rate for the number of stills that they had, when you only had one still out on the frontier, that tax was crippling. And in 1971 on September the 11th, the tax man came for the frontier, making it officially the second worst thing that's ever happened to the US on September the 11th. Recently appointed tax collector Robert Johnson arrived in Washington County, Pennsylvania, a frontier county full of a lot of war veterans. He showed up to let them know about the tax. War veterans who had just got done fighting a war about unfair taxation without representation. Now they were being told, hey, you gotta pay some taxes. No representation. They told him to go f*** himself. Well, actually, they tarred and feathered him, which might sound silly, you know, dressing a guy up to look like a chicken, but if you use hot wood tar, the second degree burns kind of lower the laughs, depending on your sense of humor. The battle was ongoing for months. The government would continue to send tax collectors to Washington County to get that whiskey tax, and the gentlemen of Washington County did not take too kindly. They called themselves the Whiskey Boys, and they beat the out of some tax collectors. Federal Tax Inspector for Western Pennsylvania, General John Neville, was determined to enforce this law. Noteworthy, General John Neville was a wealthy whiskey distiller. Hmm. The people of Western Pennsylvania loved Neville so much that in June of 1793, they built a giant statue of him and set it on fire. And this unrest was not exclusive to Pennsylvania. It spread quickly across the western frontier of the nation at the time, anywhere where people felt as though they were being taxed unfairly without representation by the United States government, less than 10 years after the Revolutionary War ended. One event in particular that I found to be quite interesting in my research of the Whiskey Rebellion was that of the local tax collector of Morganstown, Virginia, William McCleary, when a mob of 30 angry men upset about the whiskey tax surrounded his home and he quote unquote, disguised himself as a slave to escape. Use your imagination. The federal government caught wind of what was going on and they were going to get their tax money. 60 subpoenas were written by Federal District Attorney William Rowley to be served by U.S. Marshal David Lennox. Federal Marshal Lennox met up with General Neville, who offered to be his guide through Allegheny County. While going to serve one of these writs at the Miller Farm, warning shots were fired. Lennox and Neville fled back to Neville's home where they took up hiding, but the Whiskey Boys were hot on their trail and they didn't realize the Whiskey Boys' numbers had swelled up to 600, and they were being led by one Major James McFarlane, a Revolutionary War veteran who was not going to be taxed without representation. Before the Whiskey Boys arrived, Neville had managed to acquire the backup of 10 whole U.S. Army soldiers. Wowie zowie. Negotiations were fruitless. After a few hours, the women and children were allowed to leave. Then the shooting began. About an hour into the firefight, McFarland called a ceasefire. Someone had seen a white flag waving in one of the windows of Neville's home. Silence. McFarland steps forward. Boom. Drop dead. Someone, who had been surrendering, shot him. The Whiskey Boys were pissed. They set the house on fire. The total number of casualties from this event is unknown to this day. All except the one, Major James McFarlane. That one we know for sure. President Washington caught wind of the situation and was wondering what the f was going on in Western Pennsylvania. He sent delegates to help negotiate, but in the meantime started building an army. 
Meanwhile, Hamilton was publishing articles in the newspapers of Philadelphia under the pseudonym Tully, denouncing the mob violence and declaring military action was necessary in western Pennsylvania. What a baby back All three of the commissioners that Washington had sent were unsuccessful, as he had predicted. That's why he was building the army. A militia was raised using troops from New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Maryland, totaling 12,950, or equivalent to about the size of Washington's army during the Revolutionary War, to fight 600 guys. Most of these militiamen didn't volunteer, by the way. They were drafted. There were quite a few riots against that. A hundred people were arrested. Three died. President Washington personally led these troops into western Pennsylvania. The first time a sitting U.S. president was involved in an active military excursion. Which might sound unimpressive since he was the first U.S. president, but it's noteworthy that no other president did this again up until 2073 when President Cybertrump 2.0 led his troops into the Battle of Phoenix, Arizona. But we're here to talk about history, not future. Washington arrived with his army of nearly 13,000 ready to do what they had to do. They were met by no resistance. Anticlimactic, I know, but what were you expecting? Battle? It was 600 versus 13,000. Yeah, they were hillbillies, but they weren't super idle. Yeah, use your head. Ten men were, however, arrested and charged with treason. Two were convicted and sentenced to death by hanging. Both would receive pardons from President Washington. So what is the takeaway? What are we getting out of this? What did we learn after that anticlimactic ending? Do you not have any critical thinking skills? You know, figure it out for yourself. Maybe it's that the whole system's always been fucked and it's worked the same way it does now since the very beginning. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe we need to burn it down and start over. I, I'm not saying that for legal reasons. That was a joke. But uh, yeah, who knows? Uh, all I know for sure is fuck Alexander Hamilton. It was good stuff. Mm. I'm King Trout, and that was the time that thing happened. Thank you for watching.